Hey, my name is John Bliss. I'm here with Thomas Dooley, and we're here to talk mountain biking. My partner and I, Sean Lordy, are going to be racing the Swiss Epic in Switzerland, September 11th through 15th. He's here to tell First us time. about what it was like and how cool it is and what mistakes we're really making now that we've paid for this thing. <laughs> so, we're in the Bohemian Beer Garden in Boulder, Colorado, by the way, too. So, my friend, how old were you when you got your first bike? I think it was three or four. Three or four? Yeah, yeah. What was it? Oh, I think it was like a small Fair Lady Schwinn or something <laughs> like that. And I moved on to Stingrays after that. Mine was a, mine was a uh, red. It was red. That's was all red? I can remember. Yeah. Bright cherry red. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How many bikes have you had since, do you think? Oh, shit. Uh, dozens. Dozens? Yes. How many girlfriends have you had in your life? Oh, I'd say... A dozen. So you've had more bikes than girlfriends. Yeah. That is a cyclist right there. Tell me, how did you get into mountain biking? When did all that occur? Um, I got into mountain biking via Paul Turner from Rock Shocks. Ah. So, well, I, let me put go way back than that. He got me into the sport when, in a different way than I had gotten into it before. I got a stump jumper in 1981. The, uh, basically 82, 82 I think it was. When I was graduating high school, I got one of the original 500. And I brought it to Colorado eventually, and then I brought it to Norway on a trip, and then I gave it to someone. Over in Norway. Someone. Yeah. <laughs> so after she was pregnant, then what happened? No, 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 no. <laughs> Nothing like that. Nothing like that occurred. No. When I started working with Rock Shocks, I started going out with Paul a lot, riding, and and started realizing this is a lot more fun than I really ever imagined it. You know, my mind was still ten years in the past of what the and that was the technology wasn't that fantastic then either, but it was a lot better than 1982. What was your first mountain bike race, and who lured you into it? Lordy and these guys were racing with Rock Shocks and stuff, and I I can remember I went like to Mammoth mm -hmm. and raced. Um, so that like, was what 20 years ago? Or? Oh, easily. Yeah, more than Jeez. that. Yeah. So what? After they were hard back then. A mountain bike race was like really long. It, it mattered. Yeah, yeah, it mattered. What attracted it to you then, and what attracts it to you now, since you're still doing it? It was like costume skiing, only a lot better. Okay. You know, it was a lot more interesting. It also, I had liked cycling since I, since I was a kid. I worked in bike shops in high school and stuff. And so it, all that love of the, te the technology part of it, and then the, actually the biggest thing I think for me, and this is started, I kind of started with Rockchester, was the people compared to my road racing stuff that I did um, during college were so much nicer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at the my time, experience too. there was like a night and day at the time. Like it was like a, a bunch of people really wanted to get away from all the road cycling kind of douchiness. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you were roadie for a while. Yeah. But that dropped off. Yeah. You kept with mountain biking. Did you ever do BMX or no? I was a. Cross I was. A, I, I did. A, I was doing road in high school trying to be a really good racer out of Minnesota and there wasn't much coaching or anything like that and I ended up going to Super Week and my team was very not very good and I actually ended up riding with Roy Nickman at the time yeah. and he was better than anybody else so and he was alone too so I ended up racing with him quite a bit but he would crush me towards the end <laughs> but um, I ended up crashing on uh, Lake Michigan into a light pole um, when nice. I, was, I, was, I think it was 16 or 17 and that's that's when I decided it was it was just like breaking away it was the same thing as a movie I decided and I'd, I should stop doing that yeah. light pole one doing <laughs> yeah. zero yeah pretty much so let's turn to back to mountain biking and yeah the subject of this interview which is stage racing yeah when was your first mountain bike stage race that was at uh it was trans out in 2008 really yeah how was that that was extremely hard um, we I just raced really well in Leadville with Mike Hogan, who ended up being my partner, um, and uh, really we didn't really know what we were to expect. And then we were going, we went over there with Drew and Tony Gear. Yeah. We went over there as families. We had RVs with our kids and stuff, and it was just like we got into something we had no understanding, and had to, everybody on that trip had to like react to what every day was like. But one of the things I discovered early on is that they're really fucking hard. Yes. Yeah, they're hard. So Trans Alps was. First, then yeah. what happened? Um, we ended up getting, uh, I think we were sixth or oh, no, 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 we were tenth or eleventh or twelfth in there. I think. Um, and uh, and the, I think the one thing that we, the best part of that race was, um, we were oftentimes with the best women, which, we, <laughs> which was so 
amazingly fun. Yeah. And I knew Allison Sidor from doing work at Cannondale. She was on the Volvo Cannondale team, so she knew me, and we'd come across her in, you know, after like 15 or 20 miles, and she'd be talking about hockey with her, her partner was Pia, I don't remember her last name now, um, but Pia was from Finland, great, great pair, and they were just awesome to ride next to, and we knew that we were having a good day if we were near them at all, yeah, yeah. and we were having a bad day if we couldn't see them, you know, so they ended up being the people that we ended up seeing a lot of the time. And then after the Transalps, what, what were the next stage races that you attempted? Okay, so after that, um, I think it was 2008, it was not till 2011 where we kind of, we realized that there's this race called Cape Epic, I had found out about it, and uh, it sounded to be like the ultimate thing, the farthest away place. Um, the most, like, the, like it was like the Tour de France or whatever of, of mountain biking, yeah. and it was very intriguing. And so after Transalp, we were looking for this kind of what is the next big thing. And so for some reason, we did, we had just started the Justin's Nut Butter Team, yeah. And we had done, I think we had done some 24-hour races and stuff like that, but we didn't know we were getting into with that one either. <laughs> that was going to be, we found out much much harder than Transalp. Yeah. To the readers out there and viewers. Dooley got me into the Cape Epic too. Yeah. I blogged about it last year. <laughs> yeah. It's an awesome experience. Yeah, yeah. I highly recommend it. So then there was the Cape Epic. Yeah. And then what? Breck Epic? Um, we did. Um, so we did the Cape Epic in 2011. Uh, let's see if I got this right. Um, and Mike didn't finish and I finished. And uh, he broke a rib that year. And so we went back, um, I think it was the following year, to try to do it again. Um, and I ended up breaking my collarbone on the following time. If I get my ears right, I might, I might have screwed it up. It wasn't until the third time we tried that we finished together. So we did it three, that was, and I think, uh, it wasn't. We didn't do Cape Epic until we were actually, I think, all done with doing. Maybe it was between one of the. I, you lose your mind doing these things, obviously. Don't do them. If so you for everyone have any out there, left. the Cape Epic takes you down. I was. Yeah, at some I point. was on the Queen stage of the Cape Epic, doing great, and then I came down with E. coli infection, mm -hmm. and it shocked my world, and it took two months to recover. Yeah. So yeah, but it's you, an awesome race, but things happen. Yeah. So, so you've done the Cape Epic. Yeah. You've done the Swiss Epic. Yeah. How would you compare the two? Um, the Cape Epic is much more dusty, rugged, and hot, but can still have a lot of. It can have cold rain. You can have killer bees, which luckily we didn't have in the year we did. Um, it, it's. Uh, it tends to be something that you you kind of run on the ragged edge a lot, um, and and it can basically break you and like physically in, in ways that I don't think Swiss Epic can. On the other hand, Swiss uh, I would relate Swiss Epic to be something like. Um, it's it's so. I think the scariest part of the Swiss Epic is so pretty. You might not look where you're going. It's kind of what happened. <laughs> um, and but yeah. it's still amazingly hard. But you're in. You know, you're much more. The environment is much more humid and nice and grassy and green and and granity and and all the things you think about Switzerland, um, where Cape can be like dry and, and rocky and arid and like you're going through fire country and water uh, buffaloes and water you yeah yeah you it's uh yeah. it can be a lot more there's a lot more things that can reach out and grab you yeah. Yeah. yeah what's been your best experience on the bike um, as far as a stage race goes all together oh the best what is that one moment where you went this is fucking nirvana mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it was Cape Epic. At yeah. Point. Um, the reason I would say that is because Mike and I were different, and in, in I think our, how our physiology kind of worked. But he would typically pull me along for the first three or four stages, and I realized this is much harder than I could ever imagine. And, and then I would start to get better in shape because I probably was never as in good a shape as Mike until like five stages into something. And then, then I can remember we had a on a, the second to the little. Uh, let's see. On the last time we did the Cape, it was maybe the second to last stage or I think it was there was a point where we were just ripping I have pictures of it but it was just like for some reason we were going full gas and it wasn't that it felt like we could have just gone faster and faster yeah the finish line was approaching and the helicopters were swirling around us and we were it was and it was a 
perfect day. Yeah, I think that's the day. Nice. Where we were just, um, you know, suddenly we were both humming along at the same speed and and um, we were making time on other people at, at the end of something. And if you're making time on, on other people at the end of a stage race, it is, it's awesome. Because yes. if you've been, on, all of us have been in the other place where you're, you're, you're bonking and people are passing you and they won't look at you because you're the walking dead. You know that that, the opposite of that is just being like, oh my God, I can't feel my legs and I'm flying. And that sometimes happens and that was one of, the, one of those times. Yeah, guys have been crushing you for stage after stage. Yeah. All of a sudden they start wilting yeah. and you say, see ya. Yeah, and, and you, you don't know right where by. the power is coming from. You're just yeah. like, I'm glad I have it. And then awesome. cherish it. So that's the high. Yeah. I totally get that. What was the worst experience on the bike? Probably at Cape 2 where I, I bombed. Broke, broke the collarbone? Well, not the bombed? collarbone. That was, it was, uh, we were going, it was the first time we did it, and it was right before the, st the stage going into a town where the next day would be a time trial. And I was, I was trying, I was not eating properly, and I ended up just bonking my brains out. And that's exactly what happened. I ended up walking along with the bike for a while, while the, like all these people that we were obviously faster than or something, just kept coming by and coming by, and you know you can just feel the clock spinning. And so yeah, that happens. And in a race like that, you can be it can be from sickness, it can be from you didn't eat right. Yeah. And and it is exacerbated by didn't sleep right. Times it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but it's a that's the really the hardest time. So when you dissect the race, elements of it that, that are cool. What's what, what's your favorite part of racing? What draws you back? I think it's mostly, I can't really go back now, I'm getting too old for this, but I, I think it's, the thing that was probably the most interesting is that a lot of us haven't gone to war, me included, um, and I think it was a, the the sense that it was beyond cycling, it was like, what can my, what is my body going through, and I don't really know what is happening, and it's changing in front of my eyes, and, and I'm physically able to do something that I really probably shouldn't be able to do, um, and my, and this, this whole that adaptation is yeah. really kind of crazy, um, how it's changing and how it is acting as if I'm, it's as if I'm in a tribal state and it knows I'm at war, and it, and it's turning a different dial on and that dial stays the same. Nice. If I keep waking up in the morning and, I, and I'm being attacked, it will stay in that mode. But as soon as that last day is done, I think we've all had this feeling, something upstairs knows it's over and it just, your body just swells up. <laughs> like, you know, it just, it's over. And it knows the threat is gone. <laughs> exactly. And, and you switch back to this other mode, but when it's all done, you're like, you, got, you actually get depressed. I've had a friend of mine oh, yeah. from Australia say sure. about, it's de a depressing thing where it turns off, but at the same time, your body, I think that's part of your body just saying, good, we're not going to do that for a while, aren't we? Yeah. You know, But that physiological change is what's really kind of crazy. Yeah. And that's the thing that kind of sticks with me about it, is that it's not—it's more than, you can do more than you know you can and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's more like you're living it and it gets to be a little crazy. Like you start, I, I was eating huge steaks every night. I'm a, one of those weirdos that drinks drinks wine, drinks beer, eats steaks, and, and tries to give my like treat myself like a Roman when I race. <laughs> and it works. It works for me. It doesn't work for other people, I guess. But but I could eat stuff that I could never. I could eat platefuls of food. You know, a trans up. I remember the first time I ate this uh, uh, this uh, Northern Italian um, Swiss gnocchi. And I ate a plate of like a pile and I just vacuumed it up like it wasn't even there and and, uh, and then it was gone the next day and I was like my body could never do that if I walked into a pasta restaurant or the worst scenario yeah. that's really good yeah that's a really good metaphor. I remember when I finished Cape Epic, I'd always watch the Tour de France and you watch guys finish races and they start crying and you're like, why are they crying? Yeah. I finished the race, I started crying. Yeah. I had no idea why I was crying. Yeah. I, I didn't intend to cry. I just started sobbing at the end of the race. And yeah. it was all that release. Yeah. That 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 is all those months of training and yeah. all the hardship and getting sick and crashing yeah, yeah. and all just yeah. comes to a head, right? Yeah. But I think yeah. what, that's why the more than, and besides that, I think the things that happen, you're at war, not even close to it, but you're kind of, your body feels that way. But the friendships you make are so intense for that 10 days yeah. that these are my best friends. Live somewhere else, and I only, I've probably known them for 30 days, Matt. 25 days. But you bonded but I, with but them. But I bonded with them over this experience. And you see them tomorrow, and you'll be like nothing's yeah, happened. Yeah, like nothing's yeah. happened. That's why it's so great. Let's go tactical. Let's yeah. go back to the Swiss Epic. You've raced it once. We're about to race it. Yeah. 
What are your tips for people like us that are about to race it for the first time? Anything I think it's very you? similar to the Breck Epic in the sense that you, you they, they, they either will drop you down to the valley and make you climb right away, or you're climbing right away. And, and that's always that weird adjustment, like especially in a day after day stage race where it's like your legs are kind of blocked up and yeah. the next thing you know they ramp you up and then everybody's hitting it really hard and you're like, I don't know if I can do that. You're like, your body's like, I, I don't know. And you have to just trust this, this that you'll warm up and it'll be all right. And that like maybe five or 10 minutes in, you won't have that screaming pain in your legs and all that. And you'll just settle in. Um, but in the same to at the same time, though, the people are so wonderful there. Racing, I love racing with the Germans and the Austrians and the Swiss because they are so the Italians. There is a passion there, and there's also a. I wish I knew the right word for it. It's like a. I, I would say it wrong, but it's this joy, joy, the joy of life kind of thing. The joy of being on your bike is really strong, mm -hmm. and the camaraderie is really strong. So once you settle in with these people, like we had a. There was one time at Swiss Epic where we're. I was ripping down with with my partner, and we were in this caterpillar. We were there was we were all with the same physiological equals, all on a, on a like S curve downhill, dropping into the valley floor, and a downhill will last like 15 or 20 minutes, all in a line of like a dozen, and just all as a unit. It was as we were like those uh, skiers that do, yeah. do the. Synchronized. synchronized skiing and I was like what is this ever gonna happen in my life yeah like these random strangers and we're just hooting it up hooting it up yeah, yeah. probably ripping down exactly stuff. happened yeah yeah so you it once would you do it again I think I would tour it again yeah yeah I'm you know I'm, I'm at this stage where my body I think wants to get a lot of rest and, and be fit but not yeah. like get stressed to that ex extent where I'm trying to race all the time yeah but even a tour of it would be awesome because I would actually get to keep my head up a little bit longer than I did before because <laughs> you see a lot of derailers when you do these things. Yeah. So, what would be the one thing you would want to tell the viewers about the Swiss Epic if they're thinking about doing it? I think the thing that's the same thing goes for Trans Up, but even it's more concentrated in Swiss Epic. Uh, people rarely see the top of the mountains in Switzerland or Austria or Germany. I mean, think about it who sees the top of the mountains in Colorado? Um, and you get to go up after everything's kind of melted and, and see water that's, you know, limestone green, you know, and, and pure, and, and you're, you're where Heidi would dance around and play with the goats, you know. Um, and the cowbells, you know, the strange long-haired cows with the horns and all that stuff. Yeah. You're in a place where typically if you would go there, you would never get to see it. And yeah, and you're doing this whole event and everything, and yeah, you could have done this at a hike or something, but there's something about racing through all this kind of stuff and, and being in a place where it's so rare to be. You know, yeah, you can go to Geneva and stuff, but you can also, but being at the top of a glacier, kind of on a mountain bike, in a race, and going as hard as you possibly can, and suddenly realizing just how beautiful it is in that fleeting moment, is maybe worth more than standing there. And you know, it's just kind of crazy, but nice. it's, it's that pretty. You know. The hills are alive. Yeah, yes. pretty much. You want to stop and break into yeah, break into to. song. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Last question. So Lordy and I are racing. Yeah. In a new category. Yeah. The Grand Masters. Yeah. This is the oldest of the old. Yeah, yeah. How are we gonna do? I think you're gonna surprise yourself. You know, because I think that you guys, you come from altitude, you, you, you're both good climbers, and you're going to be climbing a lot, but you're also good at descending. And really, it's about just, like, you guys have done it so much, it's about keeping your cool. Yeah. And you're not going to have the the tent issues, like at Cape. I mean, I, I encouraged you, I remember. Yes, you did. To, you know, stay away from the water and, and all that kind of stuff, and stay in hotels. But as an older athlete, a, a mattress is really required. <laughs> um, and I also would say, do not not enjoy yourself at night. Like really, like you're you're burning so much anyway. Eat the food and, and eat, get you know drink the beer, eat the sausages because it's all it's why not? And then and you'll be all the better for it because you're happier and you know and you, it doesn't matter what gas you put in, it'll be it'll be burnt, you know. But it's more like it's more like uh, you know enjoy all the spectacle of every aspect of it. You know? Right on. Right. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Yeah. Thomas Dooley, TDA Boulder, best ad agency in Boulder. <laughs> cool dude. Yeah. Thanks, guys. See you out there. Mm -hmm.